Hey there friends, Dave Flatus, Can't Have Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. <coughs> Huck's here with me. It's a missing person edition of the news. And uh, we will cover three different cases today and some fascinating, fascinating uh, letters and notes that I got this week. So in my spare time, Angie and I don't watch a lot of TV, but yeah, maybe for the hour before you go to sleep at night, we'll be sitting there and we'll watch something educational. That could be a lot of things. But uh, the other night, we're watching a show with Caesar Milan, uh, dog behavior, human behavior. And we've watched him before and actually learned a lot about working with Huck and how we can be better parents. And uh, yeah, it's more about our behavior with the dogs than the dog's behavior back to us. That's what we learned. In the middle of it, in the middle of the show, Caesar was talking about suicide. And he just skimped over it a little bit. And at the end of the show, came back on. And uh, I, if you've never watched his show, I would say that you should for sure, especially if you have animals. And the reason being is that I think he's a, he's a brilliant man when he comes to reading animals and reading their owners. I think it's, I think it's huge. And I don't know anyone out there, I'm sure there's hundreds, but I don't know anybody like that. But uh, at the end of the show, you guys friends, I want to tell you about my suicide attempt. I almost fell backwards. And he said that he took enough pills to kill many people. And if it was the, wasn't for the good grace of many things, he wouldn't be here today. And he said at the time, he lost his favorite dog, a relationship fell apart, and the world just seemed to be closing in on him. And he said he tried to take his life. It, it, it stunned me. And it probably shouldn't because people can appear to be so content and so lucky in life. Yet, in reality, we're all fighting our own issues inside. Even the most balanced person. Caesar always seems to me to be very balanced in his approach. Calm. Super smart. It shook me up. Because... It doesn't matter your role in life, your success, or your perceived success doesn't equal happiness. And I just, I thought about it for the last couple of days after we saw that. And Sometimes I think, well, maybe the man doesn't understand how many people in this world he has helped in that relationship. But then I remembered, it all doesn't matter. Because if you're at that point in your life where you're that depressed, that unhappy, it doesn't really matter. Because you can't see that, and it really means nothing to you inside. And it's really sad to me. I know when Ben took his life, I thought of myself. And what I thought was, 
our relationship at the time he did it wasn't that important or as important as it was to him to take his life which to me meant the pain was so great he couldn't help himself and I suppose when Caesar was at that moment where he took all those pills he's in that same place as Ben and there's so many people out there in our world right now that are suffering just as we're talking. I think I just reiterate to you that so many people out there care about each of us. They may not be there right now, but We also have to look at our friends and be a little better monitors of them and how they're doing. Maybe make a call a little more often than you usually do. And if you know somebody who's going through some really bad times, go with them to a NAMI class in AMI. They truly help. But anyhow, yeah, Cesar Milan, I, I couldn't believe it. I deeply respect Caesar for you talking about it, if you ever heard this message. First letter. Hey Dave, I am and have been a public school teacher in California. This will be my 25th year. Every year our county school staff, teachers and others must take several short training courses concerning school safety, student health and welfare, mandated reporting of abuse or neglect, bullying, fire extinguishers, and more. This year there was a 50-minute course titled Youth Suicide Awareness, Prevention, and post -Vention. The goal being to help reduce suicide and suicide attempts in our schools. This is the first year I've seen this. Being a village member, I was aware of the skyrocketing suicide rates in our schools and brought the subject up last year in a staff meeting. Thanks for doing that. You care. The reaction was silence. It seemed the others don't want to or know how to deal with even the mention of it. Anyway, I'm glad someone in our school system is aware of the problem and has taken steps. Just thought I'd pass this on to you. Thank you for caring enough to bring it up and being tuned in enough to the world that this is a real issue. It's a huge issue. And like we've talked about in past episodes, good versus evil. Good versus evil. And when our youth start taking their lives, evil has taken over. <sighs> yeah, emotional topic, sorry. Next letter. Hey Dave, my name is Amanda and I wrote you a couple of weeks back about the kittens crying and me going outside looking for them. I'm doing better and definitely not looking for any animals in the night. I've been watching a bunch of old videos trying to catch up and we'll have, uh, we'll have the books on my birthday in September, but something weird caught my attention when I was watching the long ones. I don't know if this has anything to do with what's going on, but I've heard that a lot of scary movies or stories are based on some truth. For example, the whole Predator movie and people seeing those in the woods, well, I don't know if this accounts for every missing person, but as far as it goes for planes, I remember back in the day me and my mom watched a scary movie by Stephen King called The Langoliers. And apparently these people were on a jetliner and they fell asleep. And when they woke up, the only people who were on the plane were the ones who fell asleep. And apparently they were sleeping they travel through time either from going from the present into the future or from the past into the present, however you want to look at it. But for those people who got stuck behind, it was only them on the plane that were able to land it at an airport. And no one was around, and they kept hearing the strange noise all through the movie. Come to find out the noise they were hearing was actually the time monsters coming to eat away at their past 
as if they were able to get off the plane fueled and back into the sky and find their way back to their own timeline, they would have been eaten along with their past. I know it sounds far-fetched, but how do we know this isn't really what's going on? Especially if dimensions are opening where we get stuck in a different timeline. I'm not saying this could be happening to everybody because I doubt someone walking along on a hike is falling asleep and accidentally traveling into a different timeline, but it's kind of weird and I thought it was kind of cool to think about. Anyways, I totally agree with something is definitely going on or going to happen. I'm not the only person who feels this way and after watching your videos recently, I know that you and a lot of your followers are feeling the same way too. Now, I have a lot of friends that are nurses, and I used to be a paramedic, and a lot of them are traveling nurses, and as it is right now, all of their contracts have been canceled. They are not allowed to travel anywhere in the U.S. right now for work. They are only allowed to stay where they are at, which is odd because a lot of these hospitals are in need of more staff when it comes to my next reason for writing. I don't know if you know what's going on at the Orlando Health, but here it is. They had one patient on the eighth floor who was banging on a window with a table. The person was able to break the window and jump to their death. The patient below had told them what he thought he heard banging, but they assumed it was construction. When this happened, they quickly cleaned up the mess, made sure that everything was taken care of so that news cameras did not see it. Here is the reason why. Staffing is horrendous on the floors. They are 10 to 1 and are threatening nurses with abandonment if they don't accept the assignment. At least one patient coded based on low staffing against the nurse and I only seen him at 7 p.m. and was not able to see him again until 12 a.m. When she went in to see him, he was unresponsive, but oh claims, and they don't make enough money to hire any more nurses, which is BS. So they're increasing surgeries without increasing staff. They even had a patient set themselves on fire and die from the injuries, and another patient actually eloped and ran out into traffic, got hit by a car, and died. Staffing as of right now is this. The ICU is 3 to 1, step down is 5 to 1. PCU is 7 or 8 to 1, medical surgery is 10 to 1, and people are dying because the ratios are so high. They're saying that they're going to get 40 nurses added on to start covering, but where do you think they're going to get these nurses from? They're literally having patients that are high risk transferred to them DOA because there were not enough rapid response in nurses to assist. They're literally hiring 17 new grads right out of school, talking about that they only need six months. That is super unsafe and they're literally not hiring any traveling nurses, no floating nurses, nothing. It's terrible and it's scary. I don't know what this world is coming to. But whatever it's coming to, it's definitely not going to go anywhere where it's caring about anybody else. I'm sorry to put this bad news on you. I just thought you'd want to know something is going on because the higher ups are not letting anybody travel anywhere for work. Stay out there every one or night. And don't get sick or hurt in Orlando. Thanks for all you do. Pray for you and your family. I hear about this all the time. All the time. If you guys don't know, Angie's an RN. Has been a medical surgical nurse. She's run the gamut. She know. Any type of medical thing, I go to her. And she's always said two things to me. Number one, Dave, we're going to keep ourselves super healthy because you go to a hospital, you have a good chance of dying. And if they, if they don't kill you in the hospital, you're gonna die of something you catch in the hospital. Stay out of hospitals. What this uh, person just said about the staffing level, levels, oh yeah, it's all over. It's horrible, <laughs> horrible. A um, lot of hospitals fired a lot of nurses because they wouldn't get the vaccine and they don't tell you about those numbers. No, they don't. Next letter. Hey Dave, I just want to say thank you for all the information you share. You share. Because of you and your videos and interviews, I'm much more aware and cautious. 
I live in East Tennessee and my family and I spend a lot of time outdoors. When we hike or go to the creek, we do a lot of, a lot of things, especially during the fall. I never leave without telling at least two people where I'm going and how long I plan to be gone. I find your topics interesting and your information helpful. Keep up the great work. I'm humbled. Thank you. You need to get a personal locator beacon. Really. Next one. Hey Dave, I wrote to you a while back about an experience I had in the Sky Lake Wilderness of Southern Oregon. I have another experience to share that was in the same basic area. Before I start, I want to let you know that I really enjoy your YouTube channels. I only have one channel, Can I Am Missing Project. All the shows are excellent. I wanted to tell you that the stories you read at the beginning of the missing persons videos are really interesting. I love hearing about experiences from typical people. I love hearing about other people's points of view and thoughts. Let me tell you about Sky Lake Wilderness even before I get into this story. Harvey Pratt and I were writing the Hooper Project in Tribal Bigfoot. And I went through an area around Crater Lake National Park, made a series of contacts, off-duty rangers, etc. I was put in contact with a man whose relative had ridden on horseback with others into the Sky Lake Wilderness, which is kind of near Crater Lake. And one time they're going in there and uh, very tight quarters, bushes all around the horses. And all of a sudden, one guy on one of the front horses, there were, I think, five people in line, something pushes him off the horse into the bush. A bunch of older, well-maintained, crusty horses didn't do anything. Guy gets up, goes, hey, I felt that push. Something pushed me off. They keep riding along another mile later. This time somebody sees a hand come through the bush and push somebody else off their horse. And they described it as a huge hand and arm that had hair all over it. That's my story from the Sky Lake Wilderness. So uh, you read a missing case today about a couple and their two very young kids that were camping along a small creek in extreme southern Oregon. The mom and two kids were eventually discovered by prospectors in a hole in the ground on a steep mountainside. Dad was found close by tied to a tree. The story really caught my attention for several ways. First, I can't imagine anyone doing something like that to another human being. It's great to live like that, folks. But reality is not that way. There are some really bad people in our world. Really bad. As I thought about the story, a really creepy feeling came over me. I like to metal detect for gold in areas very close to the location where the family was found. I'm completely caught off guard um, and to think about what I would do if I were metal detecting way out in a remote area and suddenly there was a family of four in swimming suits walking up the hill being guided by someone holding a gun on them. You know, what would you do? I'm always armed in the woods and have a great deal of training and experience. I also typically treasure hunt with a partner. I just know that a situation like that it only changed many lives. I would have had to step in. I can only imagine the outcome. The story made me think that not only do we need to take care of ourselves, families, friends in the woods, we may need to help out others with an unexpected situation that we have happened to walk into. It's part of my training. I, wouldn't, I would never have walked away from something like that. I understand why others would. But you know, if you've never thought about that, if you've never rolled it around in your mind, you probably couldn't act accordingly at that time of great need. So you need to think about it. I also wanted to say that I really like your advice on handguns selection a couple of shows back. There were so many variables in a firearm selection and you really handled the topic well. Thank you. Okay, on to the story. This took place in the 1990s along the east border of the Sky Lake Wilderness. That's pretty funny because this story I just gave you was on the eastern border. 
my hunting partner and I found a remote area high in the mountains that consisted of about a thousand acres of marshy wetlands type of ground. We found the area by walking in a couple miles along an old road and it had been blocked off to travel for travel of vehicles. The road was blocked off many years earlier and had been overgrown with trees and vegetation. The road had become a rough trail that had been used primarily by wildlife. We were archery hunting for elk. Stop right there. The most dangerous thing to do in my world is to archery hunt for elk in the wilderness. More of those people disappear and are never found than just about all others. The east and south ends of the marsh were contained by steep mountains. The marshy area was on the west side of the trail and we had parked far to the north. When we got to the south end, I was looking around for a good spot to watch for elk and decided to walk around the west side of the marsh and wait till dark. There was a full moon that night. I knew that once the moon came up, I could walk back to the trail and follow the road back to the camp. My hunting partner was not willing to walk around the west side of the marsh. There was no trail in that area and he was afraid of getting lost. We agreed that we would we agreed that he would wait at the south until I came back around after dark. I now know point of separation in the dark in a remote area with water, a perfect storm for a problem, especially around a marsh, especially while you're bow hunting for elk. You've hit on many of the big factors. Anyway, when I made my way around the west side of the marsh, I found a good viewpoint and just sat down to wait it out. After a few minutes, I noticed what I thought was a person standing in the middle of the marsh. In the middle of the night? I don't think so. I grabbed my binoculars and looked out into the marsh. I didn't see anything and I thought I had imagined that. Besides the few trees in the marsh were six to eight feet tall and the thing I saw was about the same height as the trees. I waited till dark, very uneventful, waited for the moon to come up, then made my way back to where I left my hunting partner. He was pacing around when I found him and said that just before dark, something large on two legs walked across the marsh. I asked him where exactly in the marsh and he described the same area. I thought I saw something earlier. My hunting partner became really scared and wanted to run back to the truck. I stopped him. I told him that it's dark, lots of trees and brush, and that we would probably hurt ourselves running through the woods. Besides, we had our bows and each of us were carrying a handgun. We began walking back to the truck and noticed there was something walking parallel to us about 20 yards to our west. It was walking along the marshy area. We would walk about 20 yards and stop quickly and hear whatever was walking with us take another step or two. Now, my hunting partner really wanted to run and took a bit to hold him back. We stopped a couple more times and heard footsteps every time. Finally, I got fed up with this. I whispered to my hunting partner that I was pissed and ready to ambush this thing. I told them that we would walk slowly and quietly, find a little mound on the right side of the trail, get to the top of the mound and ambush it. We did find a mound. We quickly and quietly walked to the top and knelt down waiting to see what was following us. Suddenly we heard noises above us. It had crossed the trail and climbed above us. It knew that we were waiting for it. We walked down to the trail very quickly and made it to the truck without any more incidents. We never knew what was out there, but knew that this thing outsmarted us along the trail back to the truck. I've heard similar stories from natives. You can't outsmart this thing. Don't even try. You're going to get yourself hurt. In the marsh, all makes sense. The whole story just makes tremendous sense to me, in the area especially. Next letter. Hey Dave, this happened when I was a teenager. I was asleep. You know when you have that feeling someone is watching you? This is the feeling I had. So I opened my eyes and above my face was a green glowing orb, the size of a softball. I blinked my eyes thinking, okay, am I seeing this? I reached my hand from under the covers to, to grab at it. The orb moved quickly to the, near my feet and towards my bedroom door, which was open and near the kitchen and went through the wall. 
I believe that energy travels in these orbs, spirits, Sasquatch, etc. So is this a knowledge we are not familiar with yet? I didn't feel threatened. It was a playful type of feeling. That was my experience. Don't try to grab one. <laughs> Don't. I've heard some nasty stories. And I told you the story about the dogs at Skinwalker Ranch that were chasing the orbs and trying to jump up to bite at it and what happened to them. They were made into oil spots in the ground. Okay, Dave, I have to th thank you for Lola, a Pomeranian that I recently adopted from a dog's trust. After Huck came into your home, had it not been for Huck, I would never have thought of having a dog at my side. I appreciate your letters and points of view. It all helps to see what others have to say. It broadens the understanding. You have to appreciate those letters as I do to really understand the value of your study. I don't know if you heard that, but that was Huck dropping her bone out there on the tile floor. Yeah, I, there's no doubt Huck has changed our lives all for the good. <laughs> Some very frustrating moments, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Letter goes on UFOs. From experience, I've noticed that some craft occupants are not benign. Most of the sightings when I was living in the country were benign craft, and one of them played around with me, which makes me smile even now. But that is another story that matches the one you recently spoke of with a police officer having been played around with by an orange orb. However, I did come across that suddenly op one that suddenly appeared over a field one evening. It appeared out of nowhere, a large, very shiny round disc that emitted a beam of light to the ground. Then metallic sounds, talking, metallic, metallic type talking. The atmosphere was of abject danger, and I ran as fast as I could until the feeling was gone. That was in the 70s when I lived in rural England. Divine intervention, question mark. Here is one that you may, if you wish, add to the list. Divine intervention. In the late 80s, an ex-missionary asked me to go with her to a local Bible college, and I went. The principal gave a terrible lecture, awful, could not follow what he was saying. I had words with him afterwards, and he became irate, absolutely fuming. So I left the college, waited outside, and waited for around a half an hour for the lady to come out. But she didn't do so, so I went home. That evening, I, call, I called on the lady, and the first thing she asked was, where did you get to? I shall never forget those words. I told her that I had stood in the car park facing the out entrance door and no one came out. She then said that the principal followed me out. Uh, he did not, yet he did if she said he did. Explain that one. Next, when the principal came back and the, and the lady herself left and she did not see me and I did not see her. I take it that it was divine intervention that may have altered the time so that I was supposed to be in a different time than the persons that came out of the college. Strange world indeed. Yeah, that is strange. Next letter. Hey Dave, avid listener and learner of your channel for a while now. Being content, I've been content to just be that until your video recently asking the village about unusual orb experiences. I hope I'm not too late. You're not. You just made it. It wasn't until the next two videos when you read the letters that I felt compelled to write as a description of the orbs given by viewers were specific to mine and I hadn't heard anyone else describe the extra details. I thought maybe relaying my experience could help trigger memories of fellow Villagers, I live in Sydney, Australia, and I have most of my life. Beautiful city, am I, Dad? My experience happened in 96 when I was around 15. My mom, my mom died a few years earlier, and my dad, who was a fireman, and I moved into my stepmom's house and her nine-year-old son temporarily while we looked for a bigger house for all of us. One night, my stepbrother was playing up, causing problems, and was sent to his room upstairs to bed early while my dad, my stepmom, and I continued watching TV downstairs. About a half an hour or so passed when we all heard my stepbrother scream and run down the stairs crying that, 
quote, the red devil was in his room. As he had used every other excuse to come back down earlier and watch TV with us, none of us took him seriously, and he was sent back upstairs. I even remember laughing and saying, nice try, Daniel. It wasn't until I went to bed, we shared the same room, that I found out he wasn't lying. It was only about 15 or so minutes after I had turned the light off and was lying down to sleep when it happened. I was facing the wall when I heard a loud pop, just like he blew the air into a paper bag and hit it. That made me turn my head around. I couldn't believe my eyes. Only about two feet away from me was this reddish, perfectly round light just kind of hovering there. It didn't move, but I got to see it quite close. It's about the size of a big grapefruit. It looked like a glass bubble. There were also small little golden dots swirling along its surface. The whole thing was emitting a light reflection against the wardrobe it was next to, but it was only about 70 to 80% opacity. It didn't dare move, and I'd never seen this before and had no reference to judge what it was capable of. I saw the bedroom door and considered rushing out, but in my head I kept thinking it would outrun me and burn a hole through me. Whoa. Maybe because of its color, it looked like it was hot or something, so I decided it would have to make the first move so I could reassess how to react. But it didn't move. Instead, it just hung there, just bobbing slightly, almost to a pace like a person breathing. I got to look straight at it for about 20 seconds until it slowly started to fade right in front of me. At the same time, I could hear like a shimmering or glass tinkling softly against each other. I waited a few seconds till after it had completely disappeared and ran to my dad's bedroom in an absolute state. My dad, a skeptic of all the weird experiences I've had in my life, tried to calm me down, but I wasn't having any of it. Another thing I recall is that I could just faintly smell right where it faded like it was a burnt match, but it's been extinguished, if that makes sense. That smell didn't stay around for long, and neither did I. For the next few nights, I slept on the floor at the foot of my dad's and stepmom's bed as I was terrified. I never saw it again, but as I said, before I have had many and even stranger experiences in my life, which I may save for another time. All the thanks for the amazing hard work you do, and I especially want to give a huge shout out to Angie and Huck for looking after the big fella for us. Please pass this on. Well, thank you. I don't want to wake up and see it or behind, next to our bed. That would just make me highly uncomfortable. Hey, Dave, there's not much to this story. Prior to last year, I'd only occasionally heard the word or mentioned. I'd never seen one. I ended up moving to Oklahoma for what was supposed to be a promising job offer from a relative. At the same time, other Relatives needed my help caring for them as they are elderly. While I'm waiting for this new job to open up, I was needed to do maintenance and shopping for the same relatives. A tornado storm hit their house and caused damage. I helped with the aftermath math of that also. So I'm staying with them part of the time while preparing for a new job. If that new position didn't work out, I was also working on plans B and C just in case. One morning prior to leaving the house, I was brushing my teeth. All of a sudden, it became obvious that an object had appeared beside me. My peripheral and side vision is very good. This round thing just appeared, and I could plainly see it floating three or four feet above the bathroom floor. I'm guessing it was pearl in color. Anyhow, it was obvious that whatever this thing was, it was watching me. Before I finished brushing my teeth, I turned to look at this round thing. It quickly turned and disappeared, never to be seen again. I wasn't sure what to make of that, just thought I'd mention it to you. Got a question for you. Have you ever heard of a person experiencing a phenomenon where three or four number fours appear together? This began happening in late 2018 and continued for a length of time. Then last year, this year, it was 222, two, two, then 2222, two, 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 and possibly 1111. One, one. Initially, I took it as a warning and that I was protected. Then late spring of this year, I was living on a remote property and suffered multiple strokes and a heart attack due to several blood clots. I've been working two jobs seven days a week, pushed the body too hard and paid a heavy price. I'm still in recovery, but so thankful to be alive. Thank you, Lord. 
Never heard of that. Kind of a numbers guy. Like uh, I've told you before, I think that there's something to the number nine. But never heard of that four number sequence. Next letter. Hey Dave, longtime subscriber, and I've read all your books. No, I did not purchase them on Amazon. Thank you for saying that. Never purchase a missing 411 book, Amazon, eBay. Those are resellers ripping you off. Get the books on our site, $24.99. Just want to say thank you for raising my awareness about the dangers both seen and unseen in the wilderness. Growing up, my family has always spent time in the outdoors, hunting, fishing, hiking, camping, etc. I typically feel at home and comfortable in the woods, though not a survivalist by any stretch. I would say I have plenty of strong outdoor skills. In the last few years, I started doing multi-day solo backpacking trips. Kids are grown, husband's work schedule, etc. There just always seems to be a struggle to find backpacking partner. And I don't really mind since the solitude can be almost spiritual for me. I do take my dog on the trail that are appropriate for her. Listening to you present the cases of the missing made me realize I'm pushing my luck. Thank you. I currently live an hour out of Mount Rainier, and I've spent my whole life in Oregon, Washington, Montana, and Idaho. In the last year, I've added up PLB with two-way texting and the feature for my family to track me easily. I've never needed a rescue, but I did take a wrong turn on a trail once. My husband was able to communicate with me to get back on the right track. The peace of mind is worth the monthly fee. I always carry, I always open carry a waist holster attached to my pack and I'm proficient and accurate. Awesome. Take an extra few days worth of food and so on. In the past, I was almost too confident and didn't take the things seriously because like most people, I think it could happen, never could happen to me. You have certainly made me realize that it can happen to anyone. So thank you for putting a little fear and common sense into my planning. If I'm going to be a solo hiker near several clusters surrounded by boulder fields and water, there are things I can do to reduce the risk. Certainly there are. A few things also do. Make sure my husband not only knows what trail I am going to be on, but also download the map onto his phone to make sure he has an up-to-date list of my colors, brands, sizes, etc. Agree on a plan if he can't locate me or I do not make contact for a while. And finally, I never, ever pick berries. No point in risking it. I appreciate your dedication and mass amount of time and energy you put into getting this information out to the public. Who knows, maybe your sharing your knowledge will keep me from being one of the missing. Take care. Good one. I'll say something about berries. A couple days ago, Angie and I took off. A friend of mine told me about this spot uh, that had some pretty good berry bushes. You had to climb up this hill. It took us probably 35 minutes to get up the hill. There wasn't even a trail. You had to bushwhack. Up the trail, get to the top, and the top was pretty flat, and the berry bushes were up there. And you could see pretty good distance, but it was pretty thick. And uh, Angie and I making a lot of noise going all the way in. You know, it's bear territory, obviously, with berries out. And uh, we, we do a pretty good job of keeping each other close. We never get more than maybe 20 feet apart. We're always talking to each other, keeping us going. We didn't want to take Huck into this area for a multitude of reasons. It was thick, and but you gotta be prepared. You gotta be prepared. And whether you're gold mining or whether you got your head down with a metal detector sometimes you have to wear headphones with those it's the worst thing in the world you never see things coming if you're wearing ear protectors or headphones you're not going to hear anything coming never wear anything over your ears in the outdoors never only thing only time i ever do is when i'm skiing and i'm wearing a helmet so little perception there so, let's get into the missing people stories. First case, involved a man named Frank Stewart. Frank was 44 years old and he was a miner and he was in really good shape. Went missing January 14th, 1932 
in an area outside of Lake Tahoe called Cisco Grove. I've been, on, I've been through that city a hundred times, at least. Folks had a cabin in Tahoe when I was young, so we used to take Highway 80 through there to go up. Now, he was a miner, but, and he used to live in a small city called Grass Valley, a lot lower in elevation than where he was at. But now he lived in Oakland with his family and kids. He knew this area really well. And his idea was he was gonna leave on skis on January 14th and go in this area, kind of cross country it, up the Fordyce Creek Canyon below Fordyce Dam and his destination was the Carlisle Mine. So, this is uh, Cisco Grove area right here. This is Highway 80. Lake Tahoe would be up here. And this is Fort Ice Lake. All of this area, if you look at it on a map, would remind you of Yosemite. It's all open granite. It's pretty rough territory. He was gonna cross country ski up here get up here and go on the back side of the lake to this Carlisle mine. A lot of water. He was in a frozen creek bed. Just kind of get the feeling for it. Well, it's supposed to be a one week trip, but he didn't come out. Now, snow in that area can be anywhere from 10 to 30 feet. It can snow a ton up there in the winter. Now, the day he left, it started to snow really hard that night. People were afraid that maybe he didn't make it. He knew the storm was going, coming. Everyone said that. He was an outstanding outdoorsman. Nobody feared what might happen to him. But after he didn't make it, 15 search and rescue members spent three days going up and down that trail looking for him. Now they knew that there was feats feet of snow on the ground, but they figured they may ski right over him or they may see something that he disbanded. But a two week additional search and rescue at that time found nothing. And what they did was, is they, they took that Fordyce Creek Trail and the Grove Ridge Trail looking for him. These are some heroic efforts by search and rescue. Let me tell you, that, that area is super cold, super deep in snow. And this happened in 1932. Here's the part where the story goes real freaky for me. Real freaky. Fast forward to March 15th, 1932, three months into the future. And they're going to start another search and rescue. A lot of snow has melted. And on, they're on the Grove Ridge Trail. And they come around across and they find a body laying in the middle of the trail. It's Frank Stewart. And the articles described him as mutilated. Missing his head. Missing his arm. One arm. This was only two miles from the highway. Now, in 1932, I can only guess where the highway might have been, and it would be a pure guess, but this is where the highway is today, Highway 80. It's a big, big four-lane highway going back and forth between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe. But they said he was two miles from the highway, so it would have put him in about this area. So, Nobody believed he was lost, especially since he's found essentially on the trail. But the coroner comes out and says something that floored me. Says it was either wolves, coyotes, or bears that killed him and mutilated him. I thought, well, I know a little bit about this. And there's a wolf site, uh, a wolf site called wolvesincalifornia.com. And it's essentially everything you want to know about wolves in California. And it's stated in there that in the 1920s, in the early 1920s, wolves had disappeared in California. A lot of it had to do with aggressive hunting to get rid of them. Friends, January 14th, 1932, 
there's no bears out in that area of the Sierras. I guarantee it. Why? Because there's no food out there for them. And they're hibernating. There's a good chance there was five feet, six, seven feet of snow when Frank took off. So what's the coroner saying? And then the idea that a coyote attacked him and killed him, I don't believe it. I've been, a, I've been around coyotes my whole life in the wilderness, and they are very afraid of people. They try to get away. So the real key question here, <laughs> what did Frank Stewart run into? They never said they found his arm. They never said they found his head. I find it interesting that his head is missing. And why is that? Having been in law enforcement and been to many forensic classes, it is very difficult to separate a head from a body. I don't care what anybody tells you. It's not easy. So, this is uh, probably the first authentic mutilation case that I can't say that it was predation by an animal because I don't know any animal that would do that at that time of the year. Now, if you said July, August, of course, bear, mountain lion, no. In fact, they specifically never mentioned a mountain lion, so. Okay, so the next case. Next case happened in Maine involved a man named Francis Hamlin, 61 years old. He was a trapper. Disappeared November 24th, 1964. He was from a place called Milo, M-I-L-O, Maine. And he was camping at a place called Long Pond. Kind of give you the layout here. So this is Lewiston. This is Augusta. This is Long Pond. This is Bethel. Bridgeton, Naples, Raymond, Brunswick. So you kind of get the feeling. Yeah, tons of water and rain if you've never been there. Bring your mosquito repellent. Well, he got taken into a place called Long Pond. And before he left, he left a note on the Long Pond uh, sports platform where planes come in and drop people off and said, hey, he needed surf service to be picked up on December 15th. Well, on December 15th, the Greenville Flying Service, pilot Charles Coe arrived. Nobody was there. These pilots are smart. They're the lifeline for these guys out there. And they know that. So he got out and he searched around. He looked for Francis, didn't find him did find a camp and he searched around some more and he found a log book with the last entry being November 23rd. And he said, well, that's odd. Where's he been for the last month? So he flies out, gets the main warden service. They come in and they drug every pond and they weren't that big in the area thinking he fell through the ice and drowned. Yeah. They did a two-week effort of flying, ground searches. They found nothing. So on May 10th, 1966, five months later, Maine Warden Service says, well, a lot less snow on the ground. We'll find his body now. So they go back in, do the same extensive 10-day search. They don't find anything. They didn't find any tracks on the first effort. They found plenty of supplies. They said he was not in the water and they can't find him on land. Where is he? Let's take a breath here for a second. In many of these efforts to find people, it's a contingent of volunteers 
that do 95% of the searching. In Maine, it's the same way, but the wardens are much more active than they are in other jurisdictions. And they actually go out there and look around and make a big effort. The Maine Warden Service is some of the best search and rescue people in the world. I'll tell you that straight up front. A oh, hook just came back in to say hello. And uh, to think that they can't find somebody isn't realistic. But one case, you can rationalize it away. And a lot of times, the search and rescue people only have one case in a career that may baffle them. But if I take 300, 400, 500, 1,500 cases, and I start to overwhelm you with this, people just start to take it for granted. Oh, that's another one of those, or, you know, that's another one of these. But you stop, and you don't remember the effort that went into finding these people, and they found nothing which in my world makes no sense. Even today, it makes no sense. And for that, I want people to think about that when I'm telling you these stories. Now, the next story, Canada, British Columbia. I've told you before, British Columbia has some of the most unusual missing person stories I've ever seen. And it has some of the strangest stories of what can be seen in the wilderness anywhere in the world. Now this story involves a hunter named James Waller, missing October 17th, 1978. He was hunting an area called Nyland Lake British Columbia, kind of south of a city called Cottonwood. He had hunted that area for 16 years. Remember that. So, here's the map. Here's Cottonwood. Here's Kersley, Quisnell, Nylon Lake, and the Quisnell River. The focus of this effort is in this area from this road to that lake, not very far. Now, Jim was uh, employed by Palm Dairies in Vancouver as a driver. He was hunting with his son, Jerry, and his friends, Ernie and John Warwick. On October 17th, Jim and Jerry had gone out that morning, as well as he and his son, to hunt deer. Well, sometime around 1 o'clock, Jim and his son returned to camp, and his son Jerry was tired. He goes, Dad, I'm just going to take a nap. And before he goes to sleep, James tells his son, Hey, I'm going to go up, I'm going to go high country and I'll be back before dark. Okay. Now, high country to the sun meant that he was going to go over the top of the local mountains, not go into the low area. Well, at 3.30 that day, Ernie and John returned from hunting. They didn't get anything. And by 4 o'clock, it's almost dark, and James hadn't come back. At 5.30, it's pitch dark. Jim didn't return, and they called the RCMP. On October 18th, first sign of light, the RCMP put a plane in the air. And that was the day that Jim was officially listed as a missing person in British Columbia. On October 19th, SAR teams, search and rescue teams, on horseback entered the area where he was last seen and thought to be going by his son. As the horses are going in, something in the report stated scared the horses very bad. They didn't see anything, but they pulled back and they sent professional hunters in and they killed a black bear the next day in the area. 
Now, search and rescue people said that at about this time, the weather had complicated the efforts because it was so cold. It's also at this time that two specially highly trained dogs from the RCMP were brought in from Vancouver to search. This is before any ground pounders had gone in. And the dogs found James Waller's wallet near Nylon Lake. They described the, not the wallet, the cap. They, find it, they found his cap. And they said it looked like it was either cut or chewed up. They couldn't determine what. But they said there wasn't any tracks in the area. Nothing suspicious, just the cap. And the son confirmed it was his cap. RCMP reiterated for everybody, there's no way James Waller is lost. Well, that was interesting, huh? If he's not lost, where is he? They said he was wearing red and black fluorescent coat, wool coat. Hard to miss that. Wool pants, heavy boots, he had matches, he was carrying a 30-30 rifle. And searchers said that they were baffled. On November 4th, they sent a second set of dogs in that also didn't pick up a scent and found nothing. Now, I'm a search and rescue person. I'm really baffled. Because what are you going to do? You're going to pick up that hat, pick up his pillow back at the camp, maybe some used socks, give them to the dogs from the point you found the hat. And now you have a real point of reference of where to search from. But they didn't pick up any scent. So after November 4th, they called off the search. And it was a good solid two week effort. They had 11 hours of airplane time, 10 hours of helicopter time, 50 hours in a four by four, 6,000 ground pounder hours. They covered 15 square miles. And on November 8th, it was eventually completely terminated and he wasn't found. Fascinating about that, near the end of one of the articles, it said three months before Jim disappeared, he had a stroke. It wasn't a serious stroke, but it was a stroke. His son said he was in good health. But I've talked about these previous injuries, previous disability. That was unusual. It was just one sentence in one article. Now, he was a hunter. Weather complicated the search. Point of separation. He hunted all day with his son in the morning. Nothing happened. He walks off alone. How many times have I told you guys about this exact scenario playing out? Found around water. He was never found. Now, they didn't make a statement about Nylon Lake. They said it was really small. They put specially trained RCMP officers on it and they grappling hooked it for a week, they didn't find anything. And they, they said they were 100% sure it wasn't in the lake. And his son said that made sense because he wasn't even supposed to be around that area, but they found his cap there. Not quite sure what to make of that. Because when he tells his son he's gonna go high, unless, unless he saw a deer walking towards that lake, maybe he followed it, but if Jim had been the victim of predation, then there'd be drag marks in the ground. Canines would for sure follow the drag marks. Scent would be easy to pick up. There was no disruption in the ground they talked about from predation. Even though a bear was killed in that area, with the assumption being that it was the bear that caused the problems with the horses, There's a lot of people up here in Montana I know that have horses. And a lot of the people I know have giant horses, <laughs> like Clydesdale type horses. 
And whenever I talk to him, I always ask him about, well, how do the horses respond when a bear's around? They said, half the time they don't even care. They know that that bear will never mess with them. And uh, even a grizzly bear won't mess with one of these giant horses. Uh, Angie and I went on a ride a couple months ago. We were on these horses. They're like gentle giants. They're huge, huge. And uh, in fact, one of the wranglers was riding with me at the end. And we were talking the whole time and we were asking, I was asking him if they ever saw a bear and he goes, hey, once in a while we see a bear. And I go, what do the horses do? Nothing. It's like, they don't care. So, but what happened to Jim Waller? Well, that's a million dollar question. You know, his hat got cut up or munched on by something. And that mean that doesn't mean that that was in conjunction with any attack. Maybe he dropped it or who knows. And then you have the story of Frank Stewart and his body was quote unquote mutilated by a wolf, which is garbage, garbage. So what am I supposed to make of all this? I really don't know. I just give you the facts that you go meander around and let this roll around in your head. I'm always interested in stories that I hear from you guys. And uh, what I read to you earlier today were some of the best I've heard in a while. So thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, when you're in the woods, carry a personal locator beacon. Tell people where you're going. Tell them when you're going to be out. Call them immediately when you come out. Always, always check the weather before you leave. Don't compromise yourself at high altitude, even in this warm weather. It's like 90 degrees at 6,000 feet out here. If it starts raining, that, that temperature can drop to 40 degrees quick, and you can die of hypothermia out there. So don't take it all for granted. I made a video about hiking preparation it's back in that 330 video collection that I have right here on this channel. Please go and watch. In the meantime, love your family. Always, always, always do something good for somebody in your community. Don't have to be looking for it. Just when it presents yourself to you, do it. Appreciate each of you being here. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And love your family. Pull out.